was made, the research involved had become too much for one man. So Lincoln brought in two others to help, Richard Lee and Michael Bajant. And the three of us began to research in more depth and cover much more ground what the story was all about. And that led eventually to the hypothesis, which we presented in a book published in 1982, and which was called The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail. Now, it seemed very much a case that that book touched a nerve back in 1982, part of the zeitgeist, if you like, and it created a huge reaction. It became a bestseller immediately. Uh, we were on the front pages right around the world. Because we had developed an hypothesis which appeared to explain all the background. ...for what you're going to hear. This is from the Rosicrucian Digest. The Rosicrucian Digest. I'm going to read to you from uh, issue number 2, volume 74, 1996. This is called The Quest for the Holy Grail. In the Grail romances of the 12th and 13th centuries, the Grail has been associated with a family who were its guardians, and a special temple or castle where the Grail was kept and protected by the Grail king and its guardians. Now, in all of these orders and mystery schools and secret societies, you will always find reference to that which was lost and is being sought. In the Freemasonic order, it's the lost word of Freemasonry. In the ancient Egyptian mysteries, it was the lost phallus of Osiris. The Arthurian lore, it's the lost grail for which they search. The order of the quest was always more or less the same in the story. It was added to a little and subtracted from a little by different writers, but it centered around three distinct objects. One was the Holy Grail, which was the most important of the hallows, as they were called. The second was the spear of the Centurion Longinus, which is supposed to have pierced the side of Christ. And the third is the wreath of thorns. But in the whole picture of it, one point stands out. It is always a search. The search was for light. The search was for union with reality and was a great dedication, a pilgrimage toward reality. And this search had to be a personal dedication. Those who achieved the search and finally beheld the grail became a company apart but they were never organized as an organization. They became mutually knowing of each other because they had all attained the same level of insight. They were part of a level of internal illumination and not an organization. It was a lonely journey, a journey from illusion to light, from darkness uh, to participation in eternal truth. At the beginning of the 13th century, Wolfram von Eschenbach elaborated further on the importance of the Grail Guardians in his account of Parzival. He talks of Grail Knights who were bred to the pure life and who had the special task of keeping the Grail. They were summoned to serve the Grail after they had passed a test of worthiness. The anonymous author of the Perlis Vaus and Wolfram in his Parzival were chiefly responsible for identifying the Grail Knights with the Order of the Temple. Founded in A.D. 1118, the Order started from a group of nine men who took the sword to protect pilgrims in the Holy Land. It grew in size and influence over the next two centuries, acquiring fame for exceptional courage and fighting skill. 
and for high moral conduct, or at least that is the perception. That the Templars also amassed great wealth through bequests of property, military success, and by acting as bankers, traders, and security agents in most of Europe and the Mediterranean is also part of history. In fact, the Knights Templars were the first international bankers. Mention has also been made of their influence in the building of the great cathedrals of Europe. Peter Bryce notes, The Templars had the aim of guarding the routes to the Holy Land, which can be taken literally, but also in a more profound sense. Their activities put them into contact with other civilizations. They seem to have formed an intellectual link between East and West, and to have become guardians of a great deal of esoteric knowledge. Is the Priory of Zion a genuine secret society, an organization hidden in the background and manipulating affairs? Well, there's no way of knowing. One of the key things about a secret society is that it's secret, and so we don't know what they know. All that we know is that an organization surfaces in the 1950s, calling itself the Priory of Zion and lodging its statutes with the authorities in Anamas. So before that registration in the 1950s, we have no certainty about this organization at all. We only have what the members of this organization have chosen to tell us. And what they chose to tell, or rather infer, was that the Priory of Zion was protecting the bloodline of the Merovingian kings. Not only that, but its Grand Master, Pierre Plantar, was himself a descendant of that same bloodline. In France, this is akin to an Englishman claiming to be descended from King Arthur. Except that, of course, the Merovingian kings were an historical reality, not a myth. The claims of a crank, most likely. Except that there were corroborating documents, the dossier secret, documents that had come to light in the Bibliothèque Nationale, documents showing a line of Grand Masters of the Priory of Zion from the 12th century to the present day. Fake, surely. Except that when researched by Lincoln, Bajent and Lee, it was found that each of the seemingly unrelated names on that list were subtly connected in ways which would require a very deep knowledge of European history for anyone to manufacture. Nothing was ever straightforward, nothing could ever be proven, and yet a trail of tantalizing clues and convoluted pathways pointed to something being protected, something being preserved down through the ages. who observed on occasion that the way to truth was the journey of a lonely person to that which is eternally alone. It was this aloneness that seems to have been the power of the grail. Each individual had to call entirely upon his own internal resources. He had to purify his own nature by a vow taken only to the very highest part of himself. He must slowly climb that mountain between his own material nature and the attainment of the enlightenment of his inner soul. Assuming that the person achieves this type of dedication, it might be regarded as an order of knighthood. He becomes the first uh, grade of the search for the grail. And all the knights dedicated their sword handles, which were the form of the cross, to the good fight, the battle to overcome the darkness in self, and to protect the light in others. The knights of the garter and so forth were always out protecting people in distress and saving the maiden who was in the hands of the villain. The maiden was the soul. 
which is always in the hands of the villain until the individual redeems himself. Now the author of the perilous vows betrayed by the content of his story of Percival that he belonged to an order of soldier monks. So let's go back and talk about that. First, is the presence or the belonging to an order of soldier monks then militant orders to defend the faith the presence of a conclave of initiates in the Grail Castle who were familiar with the Grail and Parsifal's meeting with masters who could summon 33 other knights simply by clapping their hands. The knights that appeared had Templar insignia and seemed of an age. The mysterious or magical connotations implied here would not sit well with any kind of orthodoxy. Such references, however, and the writer's detailed knowledge of close combat and its effects on the human body clearly pointed to Templars as the Grail Knights. Wolfram was much less reticent to reveal he had some connection with the Templar Order. You see, he was either a Teutonic Knight or Templar, and probably followed the Crusader track to the east in his poem. He talks about the Grail being guarded by knights who are the purest, who seek adventure as a test of their worthiness, and who were also sent to be rulers of countries. That's a key piece of information. Who were also sent to be rulers of countries. But one thing we know is that in England, the Order of the Garter was formed not because of an accident to a lady's garter, but because the original meaning of the word, as it appears, was gradually, uh, we might say, uh, colloquialized. It was the Order of the Garter the protector. And if you have visited the chapel of the garter at Windsor, you will see the throne of those who were the members of the order. And according to the ancient order, as recorded by its first great historian, Sir Lyas Ashmole, back in the 17th century, the original raw laws and rules for the order were taken from the Black Book of Hermes on the, on the deportment of kings. And uh, the entire structure is so constituted and the thrones are so arranged that it represents really a heavenly temple in which all the gods of antiquity were seated. It is also a very appropriate symbol of the first great League of Nations that it was a symbol of the union of the rulers of the world for the maintenance of peace. The Knights of the Garter were all rulers. The Order of the Garter was an international order of leadership. Lancelot! 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 